The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said to his disciples, In those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the end of the earth to the end of the sky. Learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that he is near at the gates. Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. The Gospel of the Lord. In 960 AD, Bernard, a visionary in the former German state of Thuringia, announced that the world would end on Good Friday in 922 AD, but it didn't. More than a century later, an astronomer named John of Toledo calculated that a major calamity would destroy the Earth in September of 1186. Many people in Europe and Asia were so convinced by his calculations that they dug shelters. The Byzantine emperor ordered all the windows of his palace boarded over, and in England, the Archbishop of Canterbury ordered a national fast of atonement for sins. But the world did not end. A group of London astrologers speculated that the world would end by a flood in February of 1524. By mid-January, at least 20,000 people had left their homes for higher ground. When the German astrologer and mathematician Johannes Sofler agreed that a flood would destroy the world on February 20, 1524, Count von Igelheim ordered a three-story ark to be constructed in order to save his family. When the rain began to fall on February 20, a panicky crowd trampled the count to death while attempting to board his ark. The world did not end, but the count's world did. German monk and mathematician Michael Stiefel calculated that the end of the world would come on October 18, 1533. When it did not, he was soundly beaten by the citizens of Lochane. Nor did the end arrive as Mary Bateman of Leeds, England, said it would in 1806. Bateman claimed that her hen was laying eggs inscribed with the words, Christ is coming. When Bateman began selling tickets to heaven for a shilling each, she was arrested, convicted, and hanged. The world did not end, but her world did. In Los Angeles, a girl named Margaret Rowan announced that the angel Gabriel had told her that the world would end on February 13, 1925. It did not. Many Italians who had long placed their trust in the old adage, Rome and the world are safe as long as the Colosseum stands, were given over to hysteria when on May 18, 1954, engineers discovered of all things huge cracks in the 1,800-year-old amphitheater. Someone would suggest that it was a sign of doom and that the world would end on May 24th of that same year. Thousands of Italians besieged the Vatican, begging the Pope for absolution for their sins before the world would end. Despite a sharp rebuke from Pius XII, who told the people, the world will see Tuesday and many more Tuesdays to come, Thousands gathered in St. Peter's Square to await the end on May 24th. The end did not come, and builders were sent to repair the Colosseum. And finally, two tablets dating back to the year 2800 BC were discovered during Desert Storm I in Iraq, in the area that used to be the old Babylonian Empire. 
They commented on the trends of the day. One tablet read, times are not what they used to be. The other tablet reflected a major concern of people of the time. Their complaint, the world must be coming to an end. Children no longer obey their parents and every man wants to write a book. This past Thursday, uh, taking an invitation to say Mass for our students at St. Joseph's Central Catholic High School, I was pondering all morning long what to say to these very, very bright teenagers. The gospel for that day was St. Luke's version of what I just proclaimed about the end of time found in St. Mark. So I thought, well, maybe it would be a good idea to drive home the point that even though times were tough, that maybe that's not necessarily the signal that the world's about to end. So I thought I'd share with them some of the things that happened during my teenage years, my childhood, that made some people think the world was about to come to an end. Those of you who are my age or older, perhaps you remember the front cover of one issue of Time Magazine, which warned of the coming Ice Age. And now Al Gore and his gang are telling us that global warming is going to finish off planet Earth. Back then, we had to deal with Vietnam. It was the war that seemed like it was never going to end. And I remember a couple of classmates from Logan High School coming back in body bags from that war. It seemed like everyone that returned was messed up some way, somehow. Well, guess what? Those teenagers at St. Joe High School have never known life without a war. Desert Storm 1 was when they were little children, and now they're dealing with Afghanistan. And the sending back from that faraway place are people in body bags. I remember as a kid, one day, mom gathering us all together and praying the rosary, several rosaries back to back. I never knew what, it was, what was going on, but mom said times were really, really tough. And so we prayed, and I would discover later on in life that it was the exact time that the Cuban Missile Crisis was taking place. Well, guess what? The kids today are dealing with the fact that right now in the Persian Gulf, the United States Navy has placed three carrier battle groups in anticipation of the Iranian nuclear missile crisis. Political corruption back then, you all remember that very well. They impeached and got rid of the Vice President Spiro Agnew and then Richard Milhouse Nixon. Today in D.C., we got the Libya crisis going on right now that's going to tumble a lot of people. I remember back then being in high school and hearing about the shootings at Kent State University. It was reported by one of the, the person who was said to be his most trusted voice in news, Walter Cronkite. Well, one of our parishioners, who happened to be public relations officer at Kent State University, said that what Cronkite reported about the Kent State shootings was not truthful. Interesting, back then, finances. I remember my first legal job, where I actually got a paycheck that I could show people, happened right after I graduated from high school in 72, making $1 an hour. Some savings and loan opened up in Logan. I don't remember the name of it, but they offered a passbook savings account. David Reed, are you ready for this? Paying 12% interest. Can you believe that? How much interest do our kids get on our savings today? The same as you adults do, believe it or not. A fraction of a penny. And inflation back then was just beginning to go through the ceiling. Guess what? Won't be long we're gonna see the same thing with the $16 trillion debt that we've already accumulated. I remember watching television, the news, and watching the race riots in, in cities such as Baltimore and Washington and Philadelphia. Cars burning in the streets of these major cities as a result of the civil rights movement and tension because of that. Our teenagers today, they turn on the television and they see the riots in the streets of Greece and Spain and France. Europe is a mess. Do you remember back then what gas prices were? When I started driving, they were 30 cents a gallon. 30 cents a gallon. For three bucks, I could take a chick riding around for a week. 
And then the Arab oil embargo hit, and we were forced to pay 50 and then 70 cents a gallon for gasoline. But the worst part of it all, and maybe you remember this, the rationing that took place. You could only buy gas Monday, Wednesday, Friday at such and such station from 10 to noon. What do our kids deal with today? $3 and change gasoline. They paid $4 and change gasoline for a long time. Isn't that interesting? I also remember that then, the tensions in the Middle East, especially with regard to Israel. Remember the eight-day war? When a group of Arab and Muslim countries united against Israel, it was a huge war, and that little nation with a fraction of the population, with a fraction of the weaponry, beat the socks off that combined Arab army, just thumped them to death. What's going on today? Israeli troops are about to cross into Gaza. But you know one thing we did have back then over kids today? Music. Real music. Yeah. Where are Diana Ross and the Supremes? Where are the Temptation? Where are the Beatles? Where are the early Doobie Brothers? Where is Creedence Clearwater Revival and Proud Mary? Where is Chicago in their 25 or 6 to 4? Where is Blood, Sweat and Tears? Where is Carlos Santana? Where is all these great people? I wouldn't give you 25 cents for what the kids listen to today, gangsta rap. Bring back that classic rock. My point is sharing this with you, my brothers and sisters, from the beginning of time, people have said time is going to end. And you know what? That's one of the teachings of the Catholic Church. But one teaching that we would rather not listen to, and that's why the church at the end of each calendar year, and we're one week away from ending our calendar year, always puts those readings in so that we may ponder the end of time as we know it. Now, let's look at that gospel passage. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us about the coming of the Son of Man at the end of time. Interesting enough, John knows nothing about that. But look at Mark's account, probably the most frightening of it all. Jesus talks about all kinds of cosmological and astronomical signs that are going to take place. Stars falling out of the sky and so on and so on and so on. Tribulations, and he even talks about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem as a part or a signal, if you will, of the Son of Man coming at the end of time. Where does Mark get his information? Well, like all the Gospel writers, certain sources that they had. Mark had his own sources. Some of them are similar to the other Gospels, some are not. But what's interesting is Mark's vantage point. He's the first of the Gospel writers, writing somewhere between 60 and 65 A.D. And he's writing from the city of Rome. There's technical reasons for my saying that. But the point is this. While he's writing in Rome about Jesus Christ, the Christian community is undergoing a horrible persecution. The Christians, for all intents and purposes in Rome, have fled underground to escape the wrath of Caesar. He wanted to destroy the Christian community. But Mark's also hearing about things going on in Jerusalem. He's heard about a huge troop buildup that's taking place. Why are the Romans building up troops? Because they are sick and tired of dealing with those radical Jews in Jerusalem. It seems every couple months they're uprising and having another uprising. And Rome doesn't like that. And so Caesar has decided already to send one of his crack generals, a man by the name of Pompey, with a reinforced Roman legion to head to Jerusalem to put an end to the problem. And he did. And so Mark's aware of this about to happen. And so what does happen? Well, it begins in the year 67 AD as a guerrilla war, if you will. But finally, Pompey says, I've had enough. And he sends his troops into Jerusalem, and the result was devastating. Most of the Jewish population was killed on the spot, and the temple, well, as Jesus had said in Mark 13, he said, you know, look at this beautiful temple adorned with 
all these jewels and all these gold instruments? <laughs> the day's coming, says Jesus, when not one stone will be left upon another. And it happened. Pompey leveled the temple of Jerusalem. But guess what? The world did not come to an end. Mark knew when the temple would be destroyed, that would be the end. The Son of Man would come to take his disciples with him for glory. But it didn't happen that way. Does that mean Mark was wrong? Well, yes and no. In terms of his dating, he missed it. But in terms of the fact that the Catholic Church teaches that we live in the final age, the final era, as the church said back in 1963 in its dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, we expect no new revelation from the Lord. This is the final age. We are called now to anticipate his coming at the end of time. That's where we are. And that meant Mark was accurate. So, what does the Catholic Church teach about the end of time? Pure and simple, bottom line, it's going to happen. Life as we know it is going to come to an end, period. Why? Because the Lord said so. When will that happen? We do not know. Listen to Jesus' words in that gospel. No one knows, he says, not the angels of heaven, not even the Son but only the Father. And so what that says to me is, stop predicting, stop guessing. Live life until He comes. We do know for sure He's going to come. And that's when the planet Earth, all the inhabitants, will be judged one way or the other. Whether we live the way of the Lord, or we did not. And our reward will be based on that. So, What's the problem with all that? We don't like to hear that. We don't like to hear talk about the end of time. We don't like to hear talk about it even within the context of the church's teaching. Why? One big shift that took place back in the 60s. When I was growing up, I was so privileged to have been taught by the Palatine Sisters. They were wonderful teachers. And they used a textbook called the Baltimore Catechism. And one of the brilliant things about the Baltimore Catechism was its brevity, its conciseness, and its logic. It posted a number of questions to have to do with faith. And then it gave a clear, concise response. What happened after that, the theologians got hold of it and they began to nuance everything and then the answers went from one sentence to one book. But the Palatines taught us that it's not complicated, it's very simple. And one of the most important questions posed in the Baltimore Catechism went like this. Why did God make me? The answer, to know Him, to love Him, to serve Him in this life and to be happy with him in the life to come in heaven. Now, we've done a good job with the know him and love him and serve him in this life as a Catholic community. We Catholics especially in our work with the poor, there's no other organization that comes close to us. We do more for the poor than any other organization on the planet Earth. So we do good work and have done good work. But it's the other part of that answer that we forgot about. In order to be happy with him forever in heaven. We don't want to talk about that. Because we've gotten so comfortable here in this life. I remember when I was a little kid getting ready for first communion, second grade, Sister Carmen talking to us about how wonderful heaven was going to be. How beautiful it was going to be what angels must look like, how pleasant and lovely it was going to be, and how she couldn't wait to go to heaven. If one of my religion teachers talked about that today, I'd be getting a phone call, or the diocese would be getting a phone call, saying this crackpot's talking about death. No. We've lost a sense of anticipation of the life forever. So what are we to do? We've got to be reminded 
Life as we know it is going to change someday for all of us, for us as individuals and for the whole human race. How do we prepare ourselves? Jesus said it best. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Jesus' words are safe and secure and rock solid. And you can trust in them. When the world's a pile of rubble, Jesus' truth will live on forever. And so it would seem if we want to enjoy heaven with him forever someday, then we begin now by clinging to his word and living his word. The gospel, putting that gospel into practice no matter how difficult it can be at times. That's how we make a place for ourselves in heaven. So my brothers and sisters, good news, bad news, however you want to take it. But bottom line is, what you see here ain't all there is. My response is thank God. And let us pray that by believing together and by working together, we may prepare ourselves for that life that never ends.